The rise of emotion work in UK higher education has not gone unnoticed. The pedagogical role of emotions has been explored, often as a subfield of the study of political emotions. The conceptual framework of emotional labour has been used to shed light on the well-being and job satisfaction of academics and facilitate understanding of trends in the type of work that academics are doing. Roughly, the focus has been on how much time and energy staff spend on emotional labour, why and how it affects them. These concepts and resources have as yet been put to little use understanding and supporting academic practice. Emotional labour as an aspect of the artistry of teaching practice is still underexplored. What I'd like to do here is use that framework in a slightly different way to think more about the relationships between academics and students and think about the emotion work that goes on there. Given how important transformational learning is to high quality higher education, I think applying the emotion work framework to transformational learning and understanding what's going on there in that sense gives us a way of thinking about what it means to be an expert teacher in higher education. In ordinary adult social life, our emotional responses to situations are surprisingly predictable. It would be strange if we saw people who were very sombre at a wedding or happy and laughing at a funeral, for example, that would be out of the ordinary and we would notice that. So Hochschild theorised that there are three interlocking sets of rules that govern our emotional response to a situation. First off, there are framing rules. So these are rules about how we perceive or conceptualise a certain situation or stimulus. Secondly, there are feeling rules which govern the appropriate kind of emotional response to the situation as we perceive it. And then finally, there are expression rules which govern how we should express ourselves in a given situation. Let's think about an example. Take a member of the cabin crew who's dealing with an awkward passenger. The passenger's making unreasonable demands, they're being a problem for people around them. The member of the cabin crew has to approach them in a particular way. They have a professional responsibility to maintain a kind of happy, cheerful veneer. They need to make it seem as if it's not a burden, but actually a pleasure or a privilege to be able to deal with this customer's unreasonable demands. So what's going on in the situation is that the demands of the job require the member of cabin crew to frame the situation in a particular way. Not to think about it or not to see it as a case of somebody being irritating, but as a customer who needs to be managed or treated or helped in a particular sense. This is what Hochschild calls surface acting. Managing your expressions without managing your underlying feelings so that your expressions are in line with the way that you are required to frame the situation by your job role. Now surface acting requires a lot of attention and a lot of energy. It's difficult and it accounts for most of the burnout and the turnover that Hochschild found in these contexts. Now there is an alternative which is called deep acting and involves bringing your spontaneous emotional responses into line with the framing rules re required by your, your job. So we could say that what's really going on in the case of deep acting is that the person internalises the framing rules. In the case of surface acting, the person is just managing their expression but not their underlying feeling. And that's difficult. In the case of deep acting, the person's spontaneous feelings are in line with the expressions that they need in order to perform their job role, so they don't have to manage their expressions. So we can see in a fairly straightforward way how this might apply to interactions between academics and students. We could take a simple example like marking and feedback. It might be that when marking students work, you feel annoyed, disappointed, bored, but those are not emotions that you really want to come through in your, in your writing. You'd like the student to feel recognised, appreciated, encouraged. So in that case, it might be that what you have to manage is not your, your facial expression, but the way you express yourself through language. And that's also something that requires attention and effort and can be tiring. So let's talk about transformational learning. Transformational learning occurs when the student experiences a significant change in their worldview or perspective on some issue brought about as a result of learning. So it's not just adding new information to the stock or even really acquiring a new skill or a new ability. It's something more fundamental about a shift in the way that the student understands a particular kind of problem or phenomenon or even a shift in their worldview at large. And these can be some of the most valuable and interesting experiences, particularly in higher education. 
So for example, coming to understand the interactions between physical objects are largely a matter of competing forces really changes your outlook on the way the world is. Likewise, in economics, for example, coming to understand the idea of opportunity cost, the idea that for any choice you make, the, al the alternative, what you've missed out on, factors as a cost against the, op the option that you do pick, that changes your way of thinking about decision making. So you see objects and decisions differently as a result of having acquired this knowledge and had a shift in your perspective, a transformation. And these transformations can be difficult, both in a cognitive sense, but also in an emotional sense. It can be discomforting or disquieting to find out that we're wrong about what we took to be intuitively correct, or something that's a, a deeply held belief for us or part of our worldview, or just to understand that we were getting things fundamentally wrong for a long time. So in these cases, sometimes negative emotions like confusion, discomfort, perhaps a certain amount of embarrassment, are appropriate to the case. What I mean here is that it's unsurprising if a person feels confused or feels a little embarrassed when finding out that something that they took to be intuitively true turns out to be false. Now I'm not claiming here that they ought to feel that way in a normative sense, I'm claiming that we can predict they would feel that way. Because that's how we typically frame that kind of situation. Finding out that you're wrong about something, particularly if it's something you've believed for a long time, seems to make those sorts of emotions appropriate responses. But this is where we run into problems, because on the one hand, thinking about the cases that are relevant to pedagogy of discomfort and the way that negative emotions are used in that sort of practice, we might think there's something like an ethical problem there. We might worry about what it means to knowingly or deliberately make a student feel bad either about themselves or their previous views or something of that sort. On the other hand, there's also a more pragmatic difficulty, which is that in a lot of cases, negative emotions are not conducive to learning. For example, if the student frames or perceives finding out that they were wrong about something important as an attack on their self-image, then they're liable to respond negatively by trying to undermine that new way of thinking or dismiss it in some way or undermine the person who's presenting it to them. So part of the teacher's role here has to be, I think, setting up the right kind of framing rules in Hochschild's sense so that students in the class don't have to do too much management of their own emotions. They can experience and express spontaneous emotions in response to the transformational learning experience and the new material without sinking into a defensive response that just aims to protect their self-image without engaging with the learning. But the emotional framing rules also have to interact with what we might call the conceptual framing rules, a shift in which is what allows the conceptual threshold to be crossed. Because we don't want the emotional framing rules to facilitate a defensive response. So the two sides of this situation are interrelated. How easy the student will find it to cross the conceptual threshold depends in part on how much energy and attention they need to devote to managing their emotional responses and expressions. If the answer is not very much, then they might find the cognitive threshold easier to cross and they might be less likely to be provoked into a defensive response where they seek to protect their self-image at the expense of their learning. On the lecturer's side of things then, how successful the learning experience is depends on two sets of framing rules, both the cognitive or conceptual framing rules and the emotional ones. 